We read the scriptures as we find them in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Our purpose for reading this chapter is that which we find in our text in verses 11, 12, and 13, but you can also find it in verses 22 and 23. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great sorrow, great heaviness, and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God, blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, that this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. And whom he will, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why then doth he find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith also in O.Z., I will call them my people which are not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth and as Isaiah said before except the Lord of Sabaoth had stood and left us a seed we had been as Sodoma and been made unlike unto Gomorrah 
What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. We stop in our reading of the word of God at that point. And again, look at verse 11. The children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. And here's the reason, the explanation, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elders shall serve the younger. That's Genesis 26. And then that's explained in Malachi 1, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Notice that the perspective that is given to us here in Romans chapter 9 is that all men are found to be as a lump of clay, dirty. When he says that God of the same lump makes a vessel of honor and a vessel of dishonor. They both come from the same source. Just a pile of slimy, smelly, often dirty clay. So that when one is saved, when one is elected, notice again, Romans 9 makes it very, very clear that it's not an obligation of God to save them. They have not earned the right to be saved because God gives mercy to whom he will. It's mercy. And mercy, a synonym for grace, is a favor that God shows to someone who's not deserving of it. Definition for mercy often means that the object is miserable, unworthy. So he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will. But then the others, he leaves. And what happens to clay when you set it out? It gets hard. And here, God does the hardening. In, in Exodus, when he speaks of Pharaoh, he sometimes hardens his heart. The activity is his, sometimes God's. So when you have a vessel of honor, look at, look at verse 23, how it's attributed to the mercy of God. What if God that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. The canons of Dort express it this bluntly in the 15th article of the third and the fourth head. God is under no obligation to confer this grace upon any. is not obliged to save anyone. So instead of the perspective that we often find, everybody deserves to be saved, and it's a shame if some go to hell, the perspective of the canons and the perspective of Romans 9 is, they all deserve to go to hell. If anybody's saved, it's an activity of mercy, undeserved pity and love on the part of God for somebody who's miserable. 
piece of clay. It's that perspective, the perspective of total depravity, that serves as the background, the necessary background for our coming to a correct understanding of the truth of unconditional election. Unconditional election. What does the scriptures have to say about that truth? We first want to consider that this truth is so biblical. And then we want to see the tremendous significances of that truth. But first, that it is a biblical truth. Scripture speaks frequently of God having a special people. A special people. That's the idea that you find in that first Peter verse chapter two verse nine passage. That expression peculiar people. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. That's the King James use of a word that means one's unique own. One's uniquely who are his. The Bible uses the word chosen ones. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, the Lord, well, let's take six with it. That's necessary. Thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, for the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people to himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And now let's read verse 7 with it in anticipation of what we're going to show later. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were better, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the, ch the fewest of all people. Now the next verse. Why did he choose them, if it wasn't because there was something in them that merited that choosing? But because the Lord loved you. Now we may say, boy, that's reasoning in a circle. Well, God is pleased to do that. Why did he choose you? He chose you. You are a chosen people. Why? Not because you have earned or merited it in some way, but because he loved you. So the foundation of it is only divine love. But the passage speaks of a chosen people. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 15, Only the Lord hath a delight in thy fathers to love them and to choose, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. He chose their seed after them. We sing a versification of Psalm 33. That too had a way of using the word chosen. You are chosen. Chapter Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. There are several other verses that we could give. A very familiar one would be, many are called, but few are chosen. God's the chooser in all of these. It's an activity of God to choose. Scripture also uses the word elect. Elect. Jesus 
when he was on Tuesday of Passion Week, just a few days before his death, in Matthew 24, it's recorded that he gave what we call the signs of the times, signs that would indicate his return. In verse 22, he talks about a persecution. And then he says this, Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Verse 24, There shall rise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show shine signs and wonders, insomuch that it were for possible they would deceive the very elect. Verse 31, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four corners, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And again, we can multiply the ways in which the verses which show this. We read from Romans 9. I believe that if you reflect just for a minute, all of you would remember that in Romans 8, Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? So, without going further, understand that the scriptures are defining an activity of God in choosing, electing some for himself. When did he do that? The language of the scriptures are before the foundations of the earth. Ephesians 1 verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. Two more verses. When did he do this? Revelation 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship that beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Romans 14, or 17, rather, verse 8 as well. That beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Names have been written in a book called the book of life, written by God when before the foundation of the earth. That's the scripture's way of saying, before God created, in eternity. And we may add and understand that. It's in eternity. God, the eternal God, who doesn't have a sequence of thoughts the way we do, but whose mind contains everything and everything in a perfect order. So there was never a time in eternity past that God stopped and made his plan, determined what he was going to carry out in time. He eternally, eternally had those that he chose in Christ to be his. A particular people whose names are written in the book of life. That determination of election, that eternal determination of election, includes the determination that his son would redeem them and that his spirit would work in them the gift of life and faith. The ones that he elected, for them Jesus would die. They would be the ones that the Father hath given me. That's Jesus' language about them in John 17. 
For them he gave his life. They are my sheep. They've been gifted to me as sheep. My sheep. And he describes that to them is given the Spirit who works in them faith. It was maybe a year and a half ago that all of you remember, preached on Acts 14, uh, 13, rather, verse 48, the last part of that verse. And as soon as I read it, you're all going to remember. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Ordained believed. Just as God selected the particular Jacob and not his twin, Esau, so in the synagogue in the city of Antioch of Pisidia, where Paul was preaching, there was a response. There was two responses. Some heard what was spoken of by Paul, and they contradicted and blasphemed. But when the Gentiles heard this and were glad, they glorified the Word of God. And here it is. As many as were ordained, believed. They're believing, they're being given the gift of faith, and their activity of exercising that gift of faith is because God ordained them. Those, as many, not not most of those ordained, all of those that were ordained to eternal life believed. But now notice, they were not only the ones for whom Jesus would die, the determination to choose them also included the determination that Jesus would die and the determination that the Holy Spirit would gift them with the faith and life. But that verse also says they were going to have the gift of eternal life. As many as were ordained to eternal life in time believed. So the ability to believe assures us If we've been ordained to eternal life, we believe. We believe, then we've been ordained to eternal life. And so one of the infallible evidences, fruits of election, is the ability to believe. If you can find in yourself faith, the ability to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, maybe we just don't catch the wonder of that. But we have to go out in the world and how many don't believe Jesus? And then to find in yourself the ability to believe. And you didn't work for it. You've been gifted it. Then you have the assurance that you can find in yourself the evidence that you are elect. Ordained to eternal life. These only God purposed to save and to give eternal life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, now notice, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God appointed us to salvation, to be saved, to obtain it by our Lord Jesus Christ. When we find the scriptures saying that some are chosen and they're elected to salvation and faith and life, then immediately it's very clear that some are not chosen. Those verses in Revelation 13 and 17, some 
don't have their names written in the book of life. Some are appointed to wrath. Some, verse 22 of Romans 9, are vessels taken, made by the potter out of this clay, this lump of clay, and they're vessels that are made unto dishonor. And they are made in order to show his power and his wrath, because they are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So God does exclude some. And there's many other verses that we could give. Let me just take one from a rather surprising source. The book of Job, chapter 21, verse 30. The wicked are reserved to the day of, of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. They're reserved to the day of destruction and they shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. Job 21, verse 30. Proverbs 16, verse 4. Another verse, very simple, very clear. Why wrath? Why, why are they to be destroyed? Why are they fitted for destruction? Eternal destruction. And the answer is, the, the, the answer of the scriptures to that is this. God made us all in the representative head, Adam. And he set and he made Adam good. And he set before Adam the calling to love him and to show his love by saying yes to God's yes and no to God's no. Adam, first, second Peter, second Timothy 2, was not deceived. Eve was tricked. Adam consciously, knowledgeably, willingly made a choice for his wife and himself instead of for God. And the wages that his conscious, deliberate sin earned for himself and his whole posterity. For as in Adam all die. By one man came death, came sin, and, and death by sin. And so death hath passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5.12 The judgment of God fell on Adam, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And all of his posterity. That's why we start out with a lousy lump of clay. And if something beautiful is made out of that lump, it's the work of the potter. Making it a vessel of honor to show his glory and mercy. Mercy, mercy undeserved love. When we want to make a judgment, who hath resisted, who can resist his will if this is what he's determined? Poor Esau, he didn't have a choice. No, Esau had a choice. He had a choice in Adam. And every time Esau was set, placed before a commandment, Esau said, I choose the evil. Every time. So Pharaoh, he made a choice. It was a deliberate, willful act of his to disobey the command. And it's the command that gave them the responsibility. At the risk of, again, being repetitive. The responsibility of every human is determined not by what God in eternity determined, 
nor by what God does in his control of all things. But the human responsibility is determined by God's commandments. He commanded Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh would not do it. He refused. He deliberately made a choice not to do so. Then there's a little expression that you can find in the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verse 25. It's, it's dealing with the conversation of God with Abram about the destruction of Lot, of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and that's a neat little expression that maybe you want to underline in your Bibles. Genesis 18, verse 25. Shall the judge of the earth not do right? Don't ever say it wasn't right, it wasn't fair. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He always does right. And notice, it's not shall Jehovah do right, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. That's the title given to him in that verse. Now, Continuing to understand this truth. Does God choose and elect because of some merit in the people that he chooses? If the Bible speaks of election or predestination, is that election conditioned? by God seeing ahead that one would believe and another wouldn't, so that's the one he chose and not the other? Or is it unconditional election? Now look at verse 11 of Romans 9. The children, not even yet born, not even having done any good or evil, but that the purpose of God in election might be certain, might stand. God said then of them to Rebecca before they were born, the essence of it is Malachi's words. Malachi, the Holy Spirit in Malachi 1 interprets what the spirit what he meant when he said to Rebecca in Genesis 26 the elder the firstborn is going to serve the younger the spirit says this is what that means Jacob have I loved Esau have I hated and the spirit has Paul takes those two passages and he puts them together and says see I will interpret, I the Spirit who inspire the Scriptures will interpret Genesis 26 with Malachi 1. Election was not determined by or conditioned on anything that man would do. Verse 16 of Romans 9. So then it is not of him who wills or runs, but it's of God who shows mercy. It's not men doing things, running, willing. It's all God's mercy. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Second Timothy 1, verse 9. Who hath, okay, according to the power of God is the way the previous verse ends. According to the power of God who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Catch it. Not because of our works. 
but according to, now listen to the similarity in language to Romans 9.11, according to his purpose of election, that that purpose according to election might stand, according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us, You were there before the world began. You existed. Maybe not as something that somebody could hold, but you were there before the world began because reality isn't determined by what we think, creation, conception, birth. Reality of every human is you were in the mind of God. And that's real. You existed before the world began because that's when God gave you to Jesus. Why did He predestinate you before the world began to be given to Jesus? Because He loved you. In love, having predestinated us. In love, He predestinated us. Ephesians 1, 4b and 5. Not works, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Election is the cause and the source of our good works. Election is the cause and the source of our good works. It wasn't that long ago either that we preached on Ephesians 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2, 8, by grace are you saved through faith. By grace you're saved, by grace, grace, grace. Not of works, lest any man should boast. 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Created in Christ unto good works, which God hath afore ordained that we should walk in them. Our good works are what God ordained. He not only chose you, but He also chose your good works. Election is the source and cause of those good works. Ephesians 1 verse 12 let me take leaven with it. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose, there's that expression again, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Our praising him, that we should be to the praise of his glory, is something that he ordained in election. Maybe the simplicity of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in John 15. Now, John 15 is the chapter that begins, My father is the husbandman, I am the vine, ye are the branches. My father has engrafted you into me. But then he says this in verse 16, John 15, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, I underline this in my Bible too. But I have chosen you. Now listen. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name he may give it you. That you should go and bring forth fruit Every branch that is in me that beareth not fruit, he cut, taketh away it. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Our good works are caused by, have their source in, our election. And the same is true of faith. 
Now all we have to do is go back to that verse in Acts 13, verse 48. Faith is believing. Faith is the ability to believe. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Acts 18, verse 27, very similar language. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come and helped them much, which had believed through grace. Tucked away, you, you read it and you get involved in the history that it's narrating and, you, and we just jump over that little expression, which had believed through grace. Grace enabled them to believe. So the explanation of their believing, their faith, they received grace. The same language is in Philippians 1.29, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 and 5, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. Faith is the result of and therefore the evidence of our being elected. That's why it's unconditional. It's not conditioned by us. It's all a work of God. God's mercy. Significance. We already jumped into some of them. Let me give you four quick ones. One, you are in the mind of God as an object of his love eternally. Never in time or in eternity, past or future, are you not the object of divine love? Don't go by how you feel. Don't go by what other people do or say. You look up and you know that it was in love that he chose you. An eternal, unchangeable love of God selected you to so personal. He has your names. Jacob, as many as believed in Antioch, your name is written in the book of life. Maybe it's not the name your parents gave you, but it's the name that he gives to you and identifies your, which name identifies your place in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are so personal, so much identified in the mind of God himself as his child. It is gracious, sovereignly free. Now the implication of that first is, it's not on the basis of my being able to do good. Now let's be so bold as to know the other side of that coin. I can't lose it either. I didn't earn it by my works. I can't lose it by my works. And the scriptures are bold to tell us that. Oh, but that's going to mean then you can live the way you... No. Those who have been elected and are so amazed that they're the object of that undeserved love, they're never going to respond and say, well, let me sin that grace may abound. Exactly the opposite. The effect of the knowledge that God selected you is so humbling 
and a source of so much gratitude that you do everything you can to honor, please, glorify, and thank Him. What happened to Esau and what happened to Jacob was not chance, but was sovereignly determined in the purpose of God himself. God's purpose concerns the realization of promised blessings. Now, remember how many times we saw according to his purpose. The same thing here in verse 11. According to his purpose, he determined. He works all things in heaven and on earth according to that purpose. And that purpose is worked out according to his election, his determination of who his people would be in Christ. And then notice this. The language is that the purpose of God according to election might stand. That's why in Romans 8.33 the expression is who in all the world can lay a charge against me? Anybody. But who can lay a charge against any one of God's elect? And the very asking of the question is answered, no one. No one, because they're God's elect. I do enough for people to make charges against me. But if they want to bring a charge against me to God, and God sees me as one of his elect chosen, then his answer is going to be, I see Jesus when I look at Ron Van Overloop. I look at Ron and I see Jesus. Holy. I have no blame I can lay on him. If he didn't say it, I wouldn't believe it. That's the idea. That's the tremendously wonderful comforting truth then it becomes so warm and such a tremendous treasure when Jesus sent his disciples out 70 and they returned again with joy saying Lord even the devils are subject unto us through thy name and he had two responses. The first, he looks up to heaven and he says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Second thought, notwithstanding, this is Luke 10, verse 20. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits were subject unto you. They were talking excitedly about what happened when they told the devils to get out of people. Rejoice not that the spirits were subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your name is written by God in that book in heaven. And that's the reason to rejoice. 
Now, one of the most beautiful and comforting thoughts expressed in all the canons is this. The elect, in due time, though in various degrees and in different measures, attain the assurance of this, their election, eternal and unchangeable election. The elect, in due time, attain the assurance of this, their eternal and unchangeable election, not by inquisitively prying into the secret and deep things of God, but by observing in inside themselves with spiritual joy and holy pleasure the infallible fruits of election pointed out in the Word of God, such as, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that God created the world? Do you believe that God gave you His Word? But here's the heart of it again. Do you believe that Jesus of Nazareth is God's own Son, that He's not just human but divine? True faith in Christ. Godly sorrow for sin. Not that I'm embarrassed because I got caught, but I am so sorry to God for the sins that nobody else knows. Because I offended the love of my Father. Now notice, when I list these, how many apples do you have to have on a tree to know it's an apple tree? What has to be the quality of that apple? It can be just starting. And it can be rotten. But it's an apple. So the point is, is do I have to, how much godly sorrow? You don't have to have. It's not a question of how much. Wrong question, wrong answer. Do you have godly sorrow for sin? Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Do you have a hunger and thirst after righteousness? Do you want to be righteous as you stand before Him? Do you want to do righteousness? Those are the infallible fruits of election pointed out in the Word of God. The elect in due time. Don't see the big things that the world sees. No, they're hidden inside. And then you rejoice. Because that means I was ordained. God picked me. Before the world began, he picked you. He made you his. He's going to work it. He's working it out now. And he promises eternal life. What a special people. Rejoice. Amen. We thank Thee, Father. So much hast Thou given to us, so rich, so wonderful, so precious. May we understand it. May we never stop thanking Thee for what Thou hast given to us, though we show we deserve the opposite. In Jesus' name, amen.